How can vulnerability actually help you in your leadership role? Hey everybody, I'm Christina Cummins, creator of the Turnover Solution Leadership Program, and this is the next interview in the Elevate Female Leadership interview series. Today, I had the opportunity to speak with May Kramer, a consultant from SEI. She taught us how vulnerability and authenticity can reduce your burnout and increase your leadership capacity. So as always, pull up your office chair, grab your cup of tea, and get ready for the next insightful interview. Hi, everybody. I'm Christina, uh, creator of the Turnover Solution Leadership Program. And today, May Kramer, a consultant with SEI, is joining us. Hey, May. Hey, Christina. Thanks so much for the time. Yeah, same to you. Same to you. So we've been talking a little bit and getting to know each other just a little bit. And I was wondering if you have heard that the pandemic is over and the healthcare system is stabilizing. Did you hear that? I heard that and I reacted to it much like I'm about to, which is it's not, it's not over and it is not stabilizing. Um, and I think that people in the healthcare space or working through the pandemic in general are probably feeling a little tired of hearing some of those assumptions as well. How do you know that it's not over? Like, what are the indicators? So we are still experiencing childcare, access to school on a regular basis, access to work on a regular basis, um, you know, travel, things like that, that have not changed completely. Um, and, and what I continue to hear at work, at home, in the school environment is that really things are over and it's, it's burning people out. <laughs> yes, yes, it really is. Um... A lot of people are burnt out in the healthcare space and that does not seem to be going away, does it? No, I have been working in the healthcare space for about 16 years in different capacities in clinical and academic medicine, just commercial healthcare in general. And one of the themes, and, and I think you and I have talked about this a lot, is you know, that that is already a complex and uh, intricate profession that, that drives burnout if not approached really carefully. And you know, you have providers and clinicians and all types of support staff that are doing this amazing hero work all day long to add something that is, you know, creating systemic breakdown of a system in general. And then just the day-to-day -day challenges for, for all of the workers. And I would venture to say, especially women, it's just a lot. And it's, I think people are really starting to feel it. I'm curious to go back to that time in your life when you were in your position, working your job um, as a you know dedicated leader and balancing being a mom with everyone home, childcare issues, what did that look like for you? It was ugly. <laughs> it was it was it was not pretty, but but it actually really helped drive me to a really important point in my life where I am today in that like I'm acknowledging that it was not a great space emotionally, mentally, professionally, personally. Um, but there are a ton of lessons learned and just things to pay attention to for the future. When I was working during the height of the pandemic, I was doing leadership and talent development um, and, and working with many different leaders across many levels um, at a group of insurance companies. And so when the pandemic happened and we sort of were sent home to work from home for the sort of the flatten the curve period that didn't seem to end ever. Um, one of my jobs was to really start to orient the organization, especially sort of that frontline leadership or management level to the challenges that nobody really knew how to kind of solve, which was technology issues, access issues, issues working from home when you may not have ever expected to be able to do that, child care issues, all of that. And I think, you know, I started approaching it much like I approached my entire professional career, which was home is one thing in one bucket and work is another thing in a very different bucket. And while I can absolutely talk about my children and, you know, people know I'm a mom, there was a very clear divide for me on purpose that all of a sudden that wall came crashing down, uh, whether I liked it or not. And I fought it, you know, I fought it for as long as I could before I realized that it was just another layer of 
exhausting mental energy that I couldn't afford to spend on a complex job. And my guess was that others were feeling it too. I started working more kind of honestly in that space, just talking to other leaders, lots of female leaders, especially that I could see on camera, just battling, you know, a child coming into the screen and that sort of optic of what that felt like for them in the moment, um, battling just, you know, hearing noises in the background and wanting to jump up and check, but also you're leading a oh, meeting. Oh, I so identify with that. You can watch it happen live and people are trying their best. But again, that that personal and professional was never that blended, even if you were really good at it. And, and I wasn't, you know, and so when I started sort of intentionally picking apart that wall and saying things more honestly and just showing up and, and putting things on slides, like I would formally have a leadership development slide deck that was very polished and it was about models and frameworks and all of the great things that we've been schooled to sort of pay attention to as leaders. Mm -hmm. But it was never just, let's stop for a minute and just check in like, or maybe we breathe, let's, let's do some breathing. Or here's a picture of my daughter who in the span of this meeting found a lipstick of mine and literally put it all over her face. So starting a training presentation with that as the front picture and being like, I'm here, this is where I am. It's where I'm coming to you from. I feel like some of you are also here. Can you relate? Are you okay? How are we doing? And it was well responded to. And that became a sort of model for me to take into all of the leadership development work that I was doing. Um, just again, being authentic, figuring out what, what authentic looked like in this new blended world. And then just honestly sharing, this is not going to be easy or good all the time. But if we kind of ease the pressure on one another and talk about how we're feeling, there's got to be good that comes from that. Yeah, I, I really could have used you. Um, in 2020, honestly, I could have used you too. I'm sure, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's when it banding together and finding people that were like, let's yes. just, let's just keep it real. That was so helpful to me. And one of the things that it taught me was going forward in new roles with clients, with, you know, new leaders that I'm working with, with my friends. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to mask stuff anymore. I can't, I can't, that's too much work and energy and it's not worth it, you know? And, and what I'm finding is that the connections that I'm making now are more real than ever. And I've always felt good at being with people and talking about hard things, but just, you know, connecting on this more authentic, braver level has been really helpful for me and, and being intentional about bringing that into like all that I do going forward has also really helped. I never considered before this conversation that what I was doing pre-pandemic was masking. And as I look back on it, it totally was. And, yeah. and it was easier because everything was so much more separate. So yep. pre-pandemic, my oldest was two, two and a half. And having work completely separate from my home life I wasn't, I, I, there was no need to, I didn't have to go into the details with anyone of, oh yeah, you hear this temper tantrum going because we're totally going through a phase and yeah. there's a sleep regression and I slept three hours last night and this is the sixth temper tantrum and it's 10 AM. Um, there was no need to bring any of that up at work. And I guess yeah. I just never considered it as masking when it really was. It It, it is. And, I, you know, I didn't I didn't really either until very, very recently. But it, the more I sort of think through it, um, I do a lot of work intentionally around just diversity, equity, and inclusion for my company, um, past companies and the company that I'm at today, um, which is a consulting firm. And I feel like in doing that work, and talking about the masking, there's just, I keep unwrapping layers. So the kids was like huge piece and you know, what that means to come to work and have all of that exposed and what people's perception of me as a successful leader may look like with those kids and all that mess in the background. My company SEI does intentional conversations that are um, on purpose in their different offices. And the design there is to let pretty much anyone bring something to the group of people that are, you know, forming a network of, talent um, professionals and consultants together 
to bring anything that may be meaningful to them. And one of the things that I noticed right, right upon hire pretty much was a LinkedIn post that was talking about a woman um, that is one of our principal consultants um, doing sessions on infertility and um, menopause at work. And again, those layers, like the parenting thing is one thing about being a woman and being a leader. But when you start to think about those layers too, it's like, pretending that you're not experiencing all of the things you may experience in premenopause or menopause, pretending that you're not dealing with shots for infertility or just the emotional load of having to wonder if something that you want to happen for your family is ever going to, none of that is talked about. And, you know, that's been the standard. And I think, you know, the more I unpack that, the more I see women in my network that I care deeply for that need support there. My experience right now in hearing you talk about infertility, I was like, oh, wow, I, I'm seen. I, I, I feel like all of those struggles that I went through and I never shared with my employer about having fertility issues and then going through fertility treatment, which is super intense for anybody that um, hasn't had the necessity to explore that. I mean, three appointments a week, uh, hormone shots, it's, it's real uh, ultrasound after ultrasound after ultrasound blood tests. I mean, it is so intense and doing all of that. And then for me at that point in my life, showing up for a team of, I don't know, 15 people that I was leading at that time, all while yeah. my hormones are like going up and down and really not having a space where I could openly talk about that um, and have support for that anywhere outside of my, my therapist office, really. Yeah. Um, it was just so siloed. Life was so siloed. And the work that you're doing now to break down those walls, I, I can only imagine how impactful that is for other people for the people that you're actually working with, are you seeing that people are reducing their burnout through having these conversations? I'm seeing that they can. I see that in people like you saying, I feel heard. And I've seen that firsthand in making space intentionally with teams that I'm leading, my new coworkers, things like that. I've heard feedback from the sessions on infertility and menopause. I didn't deliver them, but heard feedback that, you know, people were um, learning amazing new things, feeling able to support colleagues, you know, just coming into a company that you're not sure about. And, you know, you hear good things about the culture, but all of a sudden you see something like that in action and it's out there, not as a marketing campaign, but as an intentional, authentic piece of a company and their culture. That felt really good to me to be a part of. And I hope to be able to create impacts like that as well. I think any time I've ever delivered a session that is focused on breaking down some of these sort of silos or letting people bring their their true selves, whatever that looks like and whatever that is in terms of comfort for that person, I've never seen anything other than benefit. The challenge is, you know, making people feel safe in doing that. And not everybody knows how to approach it. It, it you mess it up. It's scary. And, you know, you can ultimately um damage relationships if you're not doing it in ways that are, you know, supported by your company, which is often a challenge or supported by, you know, the time and, and space that you can create to dedicate to these types of conversations and work. So damaging the relationships, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about that. Are you saying that if it's superficial, mm -hmm. it can detract Definitely. I think, you know, and I think, I hope that people that are coming to these conversations for the right reasons um, that want to create, you know, supported individuals, lessen burnout, create an experience for people at work that they can bring home and everything is better ultimately in their entire universe. That should be the goal. I've seen the work done, you know, from a sort of diversity marketing perspective or just from a, hey, you know, my boss is telling me it's the right thing to do, to be real, to open space and have these conversations. But I personally, either I'm uncomfortable, have diverse opinions myself, or just aren't prepared for conversations that for a very long time didn't take place in the workplace. 
um, then I've seen damage come from it. I've seen that superficial approach or, you know, people that have been burned before, you know, I could go to a group of nurses tomorrow. Um, I was working in an academic healthcare environment pre-COVID, which had all of the systemic and structural challenges. I can't imagine in that being in that space. And I know you're, you know, in the clinical environment with the pandemic on top of it and all that's come after, but I could go to those groups and try my best doing all the things and coming at it from a very authentic place. But if a nurse that had, I'd been talking to working with was burned before talk about something that was important to them. And then, you know, got in trouble by their case manager. Those things happen quite a bit because structurally there's not support in place for, you know, mental well-being, mental health, honest conversations, things like that. And that's where I've seen a lot of breakdowns. And I think that there can be a lot of positive work done in leadership development and work that you're doing kind of coaching and things like that. Mm. Yeah. How do we truly prepare people to be brave and vulnerable and transparent? It's a great question. I, you know, I'm still figuring it it out. (laughs) I'm figuring it out. I've seen things that work. I've I've seen things that don't, right? Like I think there are a lot of um, opportunities you can create for all layers of leadership that speak to the real value. And I don't mean like the business case or the financial value. I mean, love that. Sometimes you have to make that case to get people that really don't understand to buy in and that's fine. But people that are, are interacting and truly leading teams at this point, really need to understand that it is not ever going to be a production numbers, standalone productivity type job anymore, that there is a complex requirement for leaders to be involved in different layers of, of, a, of a person on their team's life. And, and whatever that relationship looks like, fully support it, right? If somebody on the team doesn't want to share, if somebody doesn't want to talk about mental health at work, understanding that is really important, but also, you know, for the person that needs you to know they're going through three shots a week and have hormone, you know, challenges right now. And that, that they're trying to mask that, but it's really not working. A manager has to be prepared to receive that. They don't have to believe it. They don't have to align to it, but the work is too blended with home at this point since the pandemic to be anything but that. And so I think preparing managers to be able to receive the level of information that different individuals are going to bring to them that are beyond production schedule, sort of the tactical issues at work. I think that's a good starting point. Mm -hmm. Was it always easy for you to be so um, transparent or vulnerable with the people that you work with and your peers and even your supervisors? No. And, and it's been, it's been when that safe space has been created for me. I mean, and I think the lessons I continue to learn are, I don't actually care. I mean, I care and I'm going to always be, you know, as much of a professional as I can be, but I'm not going to necessarily not share important aspects of my life that I feel people really need to know for me to be successful in my work. Um, I'm not going to share, I'm not going to not share that I have kids that sometimes they get sick. I have, um, you know, a lot going on. And, and I think that that's important for me to bring, but I will tell you, it's been a lot easier to share with, with certain people that I feel have been naturally prepared because they are vulnerable, authentic, and sort of emotionally intelligent themselves um, versus people that have also been, you know, able to receive information because they've done some work, right. That they weren't naturally inclined to do all of these different layers of leadership, but through strong training and performance support models, they've gotten to the point where they recognize individuals are just that individual and they're bringing different layers of of things to work with them every day. And as a manager, that's going to come up whether you wanna address it or not. And so through, through leadership development, I've seen people make strides there. That work for me, Um, whether they're good at it naturally or whether they've done the work to get strong um, in an area where they once weren't creates a safe space. And I feel more inclined to be able to just go right there with someone 
when you and I first met, we went right there. It was not a, <laughs> it was not a long conversation. And, and, you know, I think that for me, the more I learn about myself, the more I do take it right there. Um, mm-hmm. And there is less masking, but there, there are certainly pieces that um, the comfort or, or psychological safety is not always there for me. And I have to kind of put a guard up and, and evaluate. And that, that takes a lot of energy too. It does. I, I know my guard was up for um, years as I was be- a beginning leader. The, the masking in, in many ways was shed as I became more comfortable. Yep. Um, and then the pandemic threw everything for a loop. Um, and I guess that's that's one of your main points that like we, a lot of female leaders had their kind of groove going. Yeah. And we're you know, like riding along. Things were not perfect. Burnout was still high, especially in the healthcare field. But then the pandemic came and with childcare and that burden being uneven yeah. among the genders, um, there was a particularly um, detrimental impact on female leaders when the pandemic hit. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, one of the questions that I like to ask in these interviews are, is what is your leadership superpower? And like, I've got yours. Do you know what yours is? I don't know. I mean, I no. I would love, I need I to do. tell me. Okay, please tell me. It is, it's authenticity. Yeah. Um, it's vulnerability. That is being authentically you in the workspace is your leadership superpower. Thank you for telling me that. Cause you know, I think, I think, I mean, I want that to be the case and I, and it feels really important, but when you ask somebody, you know, it's, it feels hard to say it out loud. And so I appreciate it. It is something that I really value and cause I felt it on the other end and it feels necessary now more than ever. Yeah. I think bringing an authentic self to work is a little bit loaded and, and a little bit of pressure that, that I don't know that I want to put on anybody, but also it's important. And it's important, I think, to think about what that means to an individual. It doesn't mean you have to bring every aspect. It just means if you're really trying to do your job and hiding every aspect, you're not going to perform the way you want to, the way your company wants you. And so wants you to, and so how can you get to a place where you are, you know, in a, in a better spot for yourself. And again, that doesn't mean you have to share everything, talk about everything, be a super feeling person. It's really just how do you get yourself to a place where it is real and you're not hiding everything, you know, that is impacting your day to day. If someone is struggling with showing up as their authentic self in leaders, in their leadership role, um, are you comfortable with them reaching out to you? For sure. I would love that. I'll put all your information in the description for this video. May, thank you so much for taking the time out to join us and, and share and share authentically and vulnerably (laughs) with us and creating the safe place for me to be able to share authentically and vulnerably too. No, it's been awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm really glad it was great to meet you and so glad to have these conversations. You're doing really important work. I love that you're kind of touching base with people in one of the most important industries at the most important time. Thanks, May. Okay, have a great day. All right, thanks so much, Christina. Take care. Bye-bye.